What's the word, y'all? Whoa, the Dallas Mavericks are back in the conference finals the second time in three years. It's so weird because it doesn't feel like that was just a couple years ago. But regardless, they are back. They are back. And they're going to be sitting at home waiting to see if it's going to be Minnesota or will it be Denver who they're going against. But whoa, what a series. What a story. Before we start talking about the success that is the Dallas Mavericks, let me take a quick couple minutes to talk about the OKC Thunder. If you're an OKC Thunder fan, there's no reason to hang your head low. Obviously, you want to win a series. You want to win every single game you go into. But this team was the youngest one seed in NBA history. This team has no business being as good as they are this early into their process. I mean, Shea Gilgis Alexander has been a superstar all series long, and this one he tried to do everything he can. Um, they just fell short. I remember two months, two, three months into the NBA season. We talked about in this channel, we, we briefly talked about the OKC Thunder, about them being just a great jump shooting team. And I posed the question, will they ever have that jump shooting regression? And the reality was, no, they really did it. They shot that lights out the entire year. Unfortunately, the regression to the means happened in this series. Now, there was a combination of them missing some open looks. They missed a lot of open looks throughout the series. But also, the Dallas Mavericks having a sensational game plan. Jason Kidd has had his ups and downs as a head coach. This is one of the best coach years of his career. Like... I mean, he always been known as a defensive-oriented coach. I mean, hell, the last time they made the conference finals, they were one of the top five defense and I think the 11th or 12th offense. Do you think a Luka Doncic-led team is going to be the offense? No, both of the times they've made the conference finals so far is them hanging their hat on the defensive side of the ball and living that way. So the OKC Thunder went into the series, and I thought they were real coach, and they really were, but Jason Kidd had a great scheme against the young kids, and they got out-hustled, they got out-rebounded. If there's any silver lining to all of this is now you kind of have an idea of what kind of stuff you should be looking for forward to for whether this offseason or next offseason if you're Sam Presti because you have an idea of what this team lacks and I think they could use another bigger wing um, and I think they could use another just big that you trust because late in this game they opted to go with Chad Holmgren and um, Jalen Williams because they were they got dominated on the glass for the majority of this series there's no coincidence that the games that the Dallas Mavericks won in this series a lot of them if not all of them they won the offensive and defensive rebound and battle and that's just what it was they got out physical they just looked like the young team I mean in this game I know it hurts because I think they were up by 17 at one point but man all right that, that's enough that's enough okay see I'm very curious to see what Sam Presti decided to do because I remember before the season started he was asked about all the draft capital them making moves and this and that and he said we don't even know what we have just yet now you haven't have, have an idea I mean at the trade deadline they didn't do anything other than getting Gordon Hayward who was unplayable who Man, did he score at all in the postseason? I don't think Gordon Hayward scored a single point in the postseason. Granted, in the last couple games, he didn't get a single second. But there was times when he was on the floor not doing a goddamn thing. Um, let's talk about the Mavericks, though. That They did it. They're here. Who would have thought when they made the trade at the deadline? Um, th th why is this computer talking to me? Don't talk to me right now. When they made the deal at the deadline, I think they were sitting at the eight seed. And I like the deals at the time because there's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. It made them a better team. Um, I think it's Chris Vernon. Chris Vernon used to say this years ago. I don't know if he still say this because I don't get around to listen to the show as much. You want to have as many players on your team that you can that do not suck. I, I know it's crazy to say, but it's it's true. I mean, earlier in the season, over the last year, there were some people in the Dallas Mavericks rotation that were just not great basketball players. Good enough to make it to the league. I'm not taking that away from them. But just when you think about the playoff, you want to go eight-man, nine-man rotation, you want to have as many of those people be good at basketball. And if you look at the Dallas Mavericks right now, the rotation that they ran today, they even had some Jaden Hardy over the last couple of games, which I thought was very fun. Derrick Jones Jr., I, I cannot say enough about Darius Jones Jr., man. I met him when I was uh, filming a show over the pandemic where we reacted to his highlights. And at that point in time, he was this guy with a 49-inch vertical, it felt like, who could dunk like crazy. He was on the Miami Heat. He had his moments. But for the most part, he was known as a dunker. He comes to the Chicago Bulls. He starts to expand his game. But now he's not a respectable three-point shooter, but I think he shot 32% from three with the Bulls. That was good enough. And I watched him turn himself into a more complete player where in the closeout game today, Derrick Jones Jr. had 22 points offensive defensively he was as he was 10 times better than anybody in Dallas could have expected this entire season and it's not over because they got the conference finals coming up but he has been so much better than anybody could have, could have expected and and I told this story before but last year I was doing a shoot with the Chicago Bulls and he was on the team and I was there um for media day Pre, uh, before the season started, and it was just a sign that said Kenny Beecham outside, and Darius Jones Jr. Uh, peeked his head into the room and said what up to me. I'm just just a very cool guy. If there's anything Dallas Mavericks fans, I can tell you that Darius Jones Jr. is a really cool guy, and he's been phenomenal in the series. P.J. Washington had zero makes through the first three three quarters and 10 minutes. And then he hit one of the biggest threes of the game. And then he missed the free throw intentionally, but he hit the free throws to ice it. I mean, and, and this one, Derek Lively. 
What a game from the Rook. He ended up with 15 rebounds, four of them being offensive. Offensive Hit his free throws when it mattered the most. Luka had put together back-to-back -back good games. I know he had the seven turnovers. I'm looking past that because during that run, he was phenomenal. And then at the end of the game, he was phenomenal too. 29, 10, and 10. Kyrie Irving had uh, him and Luka in that third quarter when they were going back and forth. Back, I think they scored 20 points collectively. Like, that's what you've been waiting for for Kyrie Irving. The one thing you said about the OKC Thunder that I was a little bit afraid about is that we had hadn't had a real Kyrie Irving offensive game just yet. It just didn't happen. And I know this numbers are going to say 39%, but that third quarter, I don't care about the 39%, because in that third quarter, Kyrie was electric. This is so great. They made this trade. They were the eighth seed at the time. And again, like I mentioned, I like the trade because it made them a better team. The only bit of hesitancy I had was they were going to be without draft picks until 2030. And then I had to come to the realization, none of that really matters when you have a guy like Luka Doncic. And I was listening to a podcast very recently, and it was of some people that are very in the know of the Dallas Mavericks. And they talked about how Luka Doncic loves this team. Not saying he hasn't loved his previous teams in the last five years of his NBA career, but it was something about this team that he loved more. And I, I felt that after this buzzer, how excited he was, not just because they won the game, but he was excited for everybody that they were able to do this. Like, this is Luka's best supporting cast of his career. And it was a question, the Luka Doncic effect, when you have a rookie that comes in and he's that spectacular, that generational, it is hard to build a team around him because you're not going to get the first overall pick again. You're not going to get the second overall pick again because Luka's that good that he's going to win you more games than what you probably should have. So how do you build a team around him? Well, you trade for damaged goods and Kyrie Irving. Remember, that trade was what? Doran Finney-Smith, Spencer Damian, one first round pick. Kyrie Irving has bought into this role as a secondary guy. And I mean, this is the best defense I've ever seen of Kyrie Irving's career. Great. What do you do? Last year, they were laughed at because they tanked the last month of the season because they would rather be in the lottery than be in the play-in. And, and the reason why it all works out it's because the dude that you drafted, Derek Lively, is perfect for Luka Doncic. Luka said after getting um, uh, Daniel Gafford on the team that it's just good to have more people to throw lobs to. That's amazing. And they're doing this without Maxi Kleber, who was so very good in that last round. We, he, I don't think he's coming back, unfortunately, but he was so good in that very last round. So how do you build a team around a guy that this generational? You trade for damaged goods, superstar, all-star caliber player, Kyrie Irving. You trade for P.J. Washington, who in his last stop, nobody thought he could play defense because, hell, he was in Charlotte, and now he's one of the best defensive players on the team. You go get a guy, Derrick Jones Jr., who teams have taken a stab at, tried to help get better and better and better, and you get him for the low. This is a master class, man. And they, they happen to take care of the Clippers. Now, of course, no Kawhi Leonard, but I don't really care about that. Only thing they can do is play against a team in front of them. They take care of the Clippers, and then they take care of the OKC Thunder. This is just such a great story. Now, it doesn't end here, right? They got to watch tomorrow and see if it's going to be Jokic that they got to guard, or will it be Anthony Edwards? We don't really know the answer to that. Um, but what a, what a time, man. And um, Luka looked good again. This is two games in a row where I didn't really worry about the way he was moving early in this game. He hit, he fell once, and I was like, "Oh, that doesn't look good." And then he ran to the, um, he ran to the back. They said it was a bathroom break, and they showed him on the bench where he was like biting on the towel while one of the coaches was like massaging his knee. Not a good sign. But when you see that he dropped 29, 10, and 10, and helped close his game, you don't really care about none of that. He looked good, and and and. I, maybe this is setting the bar too low. At least that's what they said on Twitter after game number five when I tweeted about this. Um, the last two games, Luka Doncic hasn't really talked to the refs. And more this game than last game he did, but it's just refreshing because that was the one thing about Luka's game that just bothered me the most. Like, I don't really care if a person tries to draw fouls. That's part of the game. I'll never complain about that. I hate when, when players are talking to the refs every single possession. And over the last two games, we haven't really seen that version of Luka. And he said he made it a point to himself or the team made it a point to him to really just sit back and play basketball. Now, there were times when he did it. And I thought the few times that he did, I think it was kind of justified. You know what I'm saying? Where there be that block charge call that he got against Shea Gilgis Alexander or so on and so forth. It was just refreshing to see Luka kind of revert back because he hasn't always been the guy that's been talking to the refs, but kind of revert back to the cheery, this is the basketball game that I love to play. And that was just so cool. Um, wow, what a game. What a series. Um, quickly going back to the OKC Thunder before we get out of here. Um, eventually, when everything is wrapped up, we're gonna make we're gonna do some videos talking about the offseason for some teams. But this is a very intriguing offseason for them with all of the draft capital that they have, all of the cap space that they have. I think this is I think it will be in their best interest to try to go get some players. 
Um, I don't think that they need to go trade for Kevin Durant or anything like that. But just going to get more players that you trust. I mean, in this game, in this series, Casey Wallace was phenomenal. In this game, not so much. Where they left him wide the hell open every time. And I respect Casey for letting it fly all the time. But he was one for six on the day. Um, fouled a few different times. Because, I mean, he's guarding Luka and Kyrie. Um, I, I, I would expect them to be... I don't think they're going to be ultra aggressive. But I'm curious about what's going on with Josh Giddey. Because he was basically unplayable all series long. He was a minus 27 in this series. Which is not great when you consider that some of these games he played 10 minutes and 13 minutes. So that's not great. Um, I, I think that the rebounding aspect is something they really got to look into. Because if you're going to win the Western Conference, you're going to have to go. Like, the Dallas Mavericks have a good big core. But that's it's not Anthony Davis. It's not Nikola Jokic. It's not Demontis Sabonis. It's not Rudy Gobert and Car Anthony Towns. So if this core is dogging you on the glass, you got to think about what those other teams might be able to do. So I would expect them to be aggressive. Not ultra aggressive. Not going out to get Donovan Mitchell. But like the Jared Allen thing, the rumor that came out with them being interested in Jared Allen, I think Chad is good enough where he can move up to the four and let Jared Allen sit in that paint and defend that way. But also kind of neglect some of the Chet defense. But I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Dallas Conference Finals again. Excited, excited about it. Shout out Lucas. Shout out to the guys. Shout out Jason Kidd. I remember last year, um, and I'm not trying to put none of Matter of fact, I'm not even going to mention no names. But I got some Mavs fans that I follow that were really calling for Jason's head last season. Again, I thought he coached such a phenomenal, phenomenal series. And the crazy thing is, Shea still ended up with 36 and still had an amazing series. But the amount of different looks they gave Shea Gibbs Alexander and how many different people they threw at him and said, hey, if, if Lou Dort beats us in the, in the game, then so be it. If Chet beats us in the game, so be it. I already saw some conversations about J-Dub on Twitter, which makes me believe that I'm too old for NBA Twitter. Um, because if you're trying to gauge a player off his first playoff appearance, you're out your goddamn mind. 